My name is David Butler. I am a production designer and art director. I actually went to school at Buffalo State College and I was a graphic design major. Pretty soon, I think it was like maybe three months into my freshman year, I went to see a play and it kind of blew me away. I went back and saw it three more times and it was not like anything I'd ever seen before because it was really intense, it was thought provoking. I then joined the theater organization and sort of never looked back. I stayed with my graphic design degree but ended up having to go an extra year of college to get that because I got so immersed in theater and storytelling. And so I've been a set designer and a little, a bit of an actor for uh, three decades. And then the movie industry thing started maybe eight years ago and it sort of came out of the blue. I was a set dresser on a film called The American Side and then I uh, worked on a Nike commercial and I, while this was happening, I'm sort of thinking, boy, that was fun. I'll never do that again. But then they just kept coming. And then there was one year where I was still kind of working my way up, worked on a couple made for TV movies. Uh, I think we did five films in one year, a lot of low budget indies. And each time that happened, we built up a little more crew, a little more experience, and the films kind of got bigger and bigger. So I just finished working on my 29th film project in the last eight years. The role of a production designer is basically to come up with the conversation with the director, the overall look of a film. And that includes the a color palette, the general feel of it, having an idea of the period and have done that research, and then basically directing all the other departments towards a, a vision of the whole film. So their job is really to oversee the entire look of the film. Technically, props and set deck, or set decoration are two different departments. But ideally, a production designer is talking to both and they're talking to each other so that everybody's on the same train heading in the same direction. So the difference between set deck and props is that if an actor touches it, it's a prop. If it's just in the background, it's set decoration. That changes unless it's big things, like a couch is set deck. But if an actor picks up a pillow and holds it, it becomes a prop. A backpack is a prop. Unless there's a locker room full of backpacks, then it's set deck. And sometimes, sometimes there's a crossover between those things. Picture cars, what they're called in film, are technically in the prop department. But that's, that's the main difference. If an actor picks it up and touches it, it's a prop. Another really great example of that is blood. Blood on clothing is wardrobe. Blood on skin is a prop. Blood on the floor is set decoration. The trick to that is, is that they often be the same color. So if somebody's got a different color blood on their body than it's on the floor, it doesn't, doesn't look right. Right, so that's a conversation. You get everybody in the same room to talk about. Other department might be the special effects stunts people. Somebody has a squib or something they get shot. You know, something into somebody's costume to blow up, like for a gunshot, like it may be split seconds on the film, but all those departments are involved in it. One of the things I learned in the, the Purge, the first Purge was this, there's these things called blood pools, and they're, they're basically rubber, fake pools of blood and you can peel them up off the floor and reuse them. And it's really convenient because you don't have to worry about to reset a shot, you don't have to like get a mop out and mop this stuff up off the floor. This is a script actually that I just got uh, and that's how we start. I get the script sometimes from the producer. I like to read it first to get a sort of an overview of it and then in an ideal world I've read it a second time and I will start writing down the characters and then I talk to the director and I say, what is this about? If you can get the director to explain why they picked the story, why they're doing it, why they think it's important to produce. And then I understand what that is. And usually it's like, ideally it's in like a sentence, like it's about this. Then as a designer or as the head of the whole department of art, we're all on the same train heading in the same direction. So that's how we start. We have that initial conversation. After that, it's the process of sketching, drawing, coming up with a, there's a thing called a lookbook, which is a, sometimes a three page, sometimes a multiple page of photographs of examples of this is what I think we might be heading towards, like something that looks like this. A lot of stuff that we get off the internet or you know books or whatever. So I might get a, a, a lookbook from the director and from the DP and then I create my own like a lookbook to start and then eventually that becomes boards, foam core boards that we would put up in the, in the walls of the, uh, the office of the film where we start putting up location pictures and we start putting up these are the kind of furniture and there's a lot of meetings that will happen in that kind of a hall way between the the department heads about okay I like this but I you know I wish could we find something in this color instead you know it's those those kind of conversations then you get into the nitty-gritty of the of the actual making it happen obviously there's budget issues materials like what are we making this out of are we building a set of something like in Bashira that film 
uh, was set in Japan. If you're in a, a place that you're not familiar with, like design-wise, you have to research it. So I had to do a lot of research of design on how structures were created in Japan. But then it's working with the all the other departments, the set decorator, the construction coordinator, uh, the prop people. So again, you're all ideally on the same page with the look after the first couple days of shooting. The producer that hired me is now showing me photographs from his phone and he's scrolling through them. He goes, look at this, look at this. He goes, this is a painting. Meaning the shot that we created is this beautiful painting. All of these people, the set dressers, the, the construction guys, the, the props, the scene painters all working together to make these visually beautiful spaces that these actors are in. And plus the, the lighting and, and the, you know, all the other stuff that comes with it that actually makes the film. It's that process that's sort of invigorating and stressful because there's deadlines. In Coldbrook, we had to create an entire museum exhibit and they gave us this big empty room. We only had the morning of the shoot to put it up. We had everything staged here. I think we packed the truck the night before, but the two stars, Bill Fickner and Kim Coates, showed up an hour early and they freaked out because there was nothing there. We get down there and we load it all up and within, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half, it's all there and everybody was fine. So I didn't hear about this until the Woodstock Film Festival where we were premiering Coldbrook. And these, again, these two movie stars are sort of chatting with me like I've known them for years. And they talked about how they thought this was gonna be, the whole day was gonna be a disaster. But not only did we get it all in there, but it looked great. After we have the discussion about this, the story and the script and the colors and the, the mood and all these sort of things, and the, the set decorator is, has gotten the furniture and the, you know, all these things that we've talked about from the script. And it's things like, let's say there's a love scene. It's gonna move through a room. Part of the creative process would be to talk to the DP about how he's gonna shoot it. In a matter of seconds, we might have to help you understand what a character is like. I'll use the idea of a coffee mug. There's a scene where someone's running through the kitchen, they grab a coffee mug and they take a sip of it. What is that coffee mug? And what can I say about the character? Are there plants in the background? Are there plants alive? Have they not watered them for weeks? Or are they, you know, is it like a garden, a healthy garden? Because that says something about the character. Like, you know, how do they make coffee? Do they use a Keurig? Do they use a, a percolator? Are they doing French press? All those three different ways of making coffee says something about that character. What color are the walls in the bedroom? One of my uh, favorite things that I learned early on, production designer named Lisa Myers, and she has this term called life flare, and it's that layer of realism. So you go in and you, you do the set and you put the lamp on the side table in the bedroom and you put the bed sheets down and the pillows and everything, and it all looks perfect, but it doesn't look real, right? What makes it look real is that last layer of stuff. She described it as the stuff that's in your pockets that you take out of your pockets before you go to bed. So it might be a set of keys, it might be a post-it note that reminds you to do something. Coins, a little doll or something you picked up on the street, or something that your, your boyfriend gave you that happens to be on the, on the side table. Um, but it doesn't, it's not staged, it, it's just something you just throw it down. So the, the set dressing, which is again related to props, is helping you to understand the character. You know, what kind of books are on the shelf? What kind of bookcase is it? What kind of lamp? Does a, a woman in a present day film have a, her house is full of antiques? Or did she go to a place like Target or Ikea to get her lamps? That skin that says something about a character. And then you add all these other things into it and then you have more of a 3D person as opposed to just like something, somebody that just shows up in the screen. And you may not even see these things consciously, but it helps in the storytelling to sort of put you in a place. To go back to the technical end of this, like what is a day like? Every day is different. At the beginning, you're doing the research, resourcing things and finding things. And then you get into the middle phase where you're prepping the actual sets. And then at some point, because once they start shooting, there's no way you could get everything set. So you're sort of, it's this constant flow of prepping, you know, things get taken down and then the, something else is prepping while you're, you know, shooting and then it gets taken down. So it's this constant thing with schedules and having things ready and, and things change. Sometimes an actor can't make it. The thing that you thought you had a week to get ready now has to be ready tomorrow or, you know, that kind of stuff. It's constantly creative problem solving. Even with the most preparation, things go wrong and you just have to be on it. In Coldbrook, there's a very short scene in the middle of the film 
where you see the shipwreck. The director, Bill Fickner, had been on a perfect storm. He would not let us do anything where we couldn't control the temperature of the water. So then, like, I called a friend of mine in LA about, like, how do you do, like, a boat, you know, sinking into the water? And he's like, well, you gotta find a swimming pool, you gotta empty it, you gotta build your set in it, and then fill it with water. And I'm like, oh, we can do that. But then it's like, will it float? What killed that was finding out that we found a pool, we're ready to go, and that it was gonna take four days to fill the pool back up with a garden hose. We didn't have four days to do that. So we had to come up with something else. There was a moment when the department heads got together and said, maybe we'll just cut the scene. And I'm like, you can't cut the scene. This whole thing is about a shipwreck. The DP says, why don't you do like a seesaw? And the way my brain works is that's all I needed. We made this platform so that it would, would move up and down like this on a seesaw, and then we built like a pirate ship railing on the side of it. We found a fire hall. They took the fire trucks out. They put black material all the way around the outside of the, the space. People have uh, sprinklers. There's, uh, I'm like loading up a bucket of water and every time the, the seesaw goes like this, I pour water. Guys are doing lightning. You see one actor that's reaching out towards his wife right at the edge of the floor of the ship and the railing. And then we flipped the thing around, added some different props and had the other actress reaching out to him. And then they spliced the two things together so that it actually looks like it's you know, a 20 foot long piece of set when actually it was only 12 feet. The production designer is mainly the big vision of everything. And then the art director underneath it is sort of the one that's sort of getting into the dirt and making sure that things are ready and happening. And then each of the departments under, you know, underneath that, the set decorator and the prop person are all responsible for those things. So in a bigger film, that's all, all that stress is sort of disseminated to all these different departments. It's constantly transforming as the thing goes. And then when you're done, then you gotta take everything apart and put everything back where it belongs. So that's like at the end, there's that. As a designer, my main job is to create the environment that a story happens in. That includes the period, whether you know if it's 1970 or 1930 or 19, you know 2100, whatever in the future. Kulpark is basically about these two guys. One of their jobs is to sort of oversee this exhibit of a shipwreck, and it was like a whole museum exhibit. I'm very proud of this because we had, again, a sourcing things. We got things from museums. We made our own things. We got new things and made them look old. It's just like the shipwreck was 1823. So again, you got to research what does stuff look like? What kind of guns? What kind of clothing? I got theaters to give me old dresses from that period that we then soaked in water for a couple days. We have guns that we made. That were replicas that we then made look like they were underwater. This is what it looks like. Another example would be Marshall. I worked in the set deck department and I had to find period phones. There's like two pay phones. So what does a pay phone look like in 1938? What does a pay phone look like in 1942? And then you find out that, that during that period, there was a change between the old early like 1930s film. You'll see you know, the, the guy with his, like a horn and a thing you hold up to your ear. There was a transition between that kind of a phone and the, the cradle phone that, went, that came afterwards. You'll see uh, when Thurgood Marshall is in the phone booth talking to his wife in a courthouse, he has the modern, more modern phone. But when he goes to a train station in the South, they didn't change the phone yet. And so it also shows a different, you know, class and, you know, city versus country. Uh, and those are the other little details that come into production design. But then it's getting into the characters, into the scenes. What is a scene supposed to feel like? Something might be minimal, uh, like all blacks and whites or, you know, gray tones, or it might be something that needs have heavy textures because it affects the character. And production design is not about story, it's more about the characters. Our job in the art department is to create that environment and tell you a little bit more about a character literally in seconds, or to create a mood that sort of sets the scene. I think sometimes we can be just as manipulative of emotions as the director can be and how they manipulate the actors. An example would be a really pristine, perfect set that then becomes a bloody mess creates the contrast of making something seem even more violent than it might have been if you had already started in a place that was already a mess. And what that does is it creates this a contrast to help tell the story in a more dramatic way. We did a show uh, called After the Sun Fell and there was an actress that was coming, she was a uh, Broadway actress that was coming literally the day before they started shooting and we had to create her house. Her character had gone through the death of a son and was in denial about it. The whole family is sort of in denial about this. She walked in, she still had her luggage in her hand from the airport, and she walks into this room and she started to tear up. 
And she said, this is my house. And I'm like, we're like, yes. <laughs> and it was supposed to be sad, right? So it's just piles of stuff. And we put little marks on the wall as if paintings had been taken off of the wall. So it was this really sad place that you see at the beginning of the film. And then there's this really dramatic moment where she comes to terms with this death with her son. At that point, she's starting to clean the room up. But to set that up for her and have her see it and feel it as soon as she, you know, the day before she shoots, that's our other job is to help the actors to help them fulfill their characters. The issue with that, if you know, imagine the room we're in now and you have like piles of books and clothing and boxes and stuff, like it could take forever continuity wise to like move something out of the way for a camera and then have to put it back when they're reversing the shots. We did this really smart thing and we put all of these piles of stuff on wheels so that you know, you, we hid the wheels by putting boxes over them so that you could take a whole you know, two piles of stuff and slide it into the other room, put the camera there, and then we would just slide it back in. So uh, that we got kudos from the DP for that. That's also part of the fun, uh, is sort of creating the look that you want and knowing how to do it. On a, on a bigger film, it's different because I don't, I can't touch anything. Uh, in a union film, all I'm doing is I'm saying, I, I, I'm giving the scenic charge, the head scene painter, uh, photographs and, and the, probably the prop person is ordering the guns and then they get together and they figure it out. On a smaller film, ideally it's one mind that's sort of figuring all these things out. During Bashira, I would spend hours in my office trying to come up with the right recipe for slime because there's a lot of slime in that film. So I learned a lot about slime. So I guess that's one of the other things that's a blast is that every one of these, there's a different challenge and you learn something. So if you come into this department and you think you know everything, you're not gonna last very long. Even me, you know, that's been doing it for a long time. I had a day job for 17 years, and so I sort of did the other things that I love to do on the side. I was doing theater. I made a decision to jump off the cliff of self-employment, and I've, I've survived, I think, and it's probably closer to 15 years. I'm a little in denial about numbers these days. We have two businesses that we run out of our shop. My business, which is David Butler Designs and Procreation. Out of this space, uh, when we're not doing film, we do everything from party decorations to dance, theater, ballet, sets, art installations. My two partners approached me because we were running out of room in here. The film industry was starting to come in and it seemed like it was going to continue. So we decided to create a separate business called Buffalo Props. We have a website and we're heading towards cataloging everything so that you will eventually be able to go to our website. And if you need an Art Deco lamp, click on Art Deco lamp and you'll get some some choices, because that's how that's how it works in other cities. It's a fledgling prop house. We're not an LA prop house at this point where you drive your box truck and fill it up with everything you need. We're not there yet, but I think as Buffalo becomes more of a film town, uh, we'll become more and more of a resource. Every time we do something, or if we see something on the street that somebody's thrown out that's really cool, we hang on to it. I, I get called up and say, I've got a, a 1940s radio in my parents' basement, do you want to come get it? We're learning to collect iconic things and cool things at this point. This is a small shop, so on the indies, this place is very active. On a major, we're setting up an entire workshop with tools and you know power tools and equipment. The scene painters have their own space, but the advantage of that is that everybody's in the same room or in the same building so that you can cross the building and say, hey, that door that you guys are painting, we need that for tomorrow. Our collection of things is a little bit of everything from people donating things to us, like we need to get this out of our house, to things that we would actually purchase. One of the things that's sort of fun about Buffalo is that we don't have a big prop house like LA and New York does, but the sort of joke here is, is that it's in everybody's basement. And there has never been a time, at least so far, where I haven't needed to find something and I found it through a social media post. For instance, recently uh, we had a, a Del Toro film in town and they needed period bicycles. So I found one here and one there and then someone said you should go to a local bike shop. So I go to this place, it's been on Allen Street for decades, turns out uh, it was started, I think, in the 1890s. So I get there and they're like, oh, we have your bikes. They take me down into the basement and it's like a museum of bikes. Like there are hundreds of bikes in this place that range from 1890s all the way to modern day. So I now know, and so does Toronto, that that now is a resource for uh, period bikes. And I also learned how you can tell the difference between this type of bike and a year, a couple years later when things change, just like the phone. That's, and that's part of the journey of this is, is finding things and realizing that they're all, uh, they're all nearby.